Hello and a very warm welcome and sorry for the delay from uh, the Institute for the Danube region in Central Europe. My name is Sebastian Schaeffer. I'm going to be the moderator for uh, this uh, event on the parliamentary elections in North Macedonia. And I have with me um, one of our two cooperation partners. We organize this uh, together with uh, the Renner Institute and the Politische Akademie. And I have Gerhard Machel with me who is going to present us the briefing on uh, the elections in North Macedonia while we in the back are sorting out the last technical difficulties and then hopefully can start with the panel discussion. So I will postpone the introduction of our panelists and will hand uh, directly over, over uh, to Gerhard to present us some information about um, the upcoming elections. Gerhard. Thank you, Sebastian. Good, good afternoon also from my side and a warm welcome. I would like to welcome you on behalf of the Karl Renner Institute, the IDM and the Politische Akademie of the ÖVP. I'm Gerhard Machel and I'm responsible for European Affairs at the Karl Renner Institute. This event belongs to a series of discussions organized by these three institutions in which we focus on the situation in the forefront of parliamentary elections in Central, Eastern and Southeastern Europe countries. Uh, you might have noticed that uh, within less than four weeks, uh, three countries hold parliamentary elections in the region. Serbia started in mid-June, Croatia followed about a week ago, and this Wednesday, so the day after tomorrow, North Macedonia will vote for a new parliament. All this is happening amid of the COVID-19 pandemic. And let me remind you that in North Macedonia, between 100 and 200 persons are tested positive for corona every day. So uh, the pandemic is still going on in the region and especially also in North Macedonia. All three institutions, so the Caloran Institute, the IDM and the Politische Academy have a special interest in the Western Balkans. For the IDM, I would say Southeastern Europe belongs to its mission. For the Caloran Institute, and I dare say also for the Politische Academy, the Western Balkans are in the core of their international activities. Let me bring an example concerning the Caloran Institute. We are co-founder of the initiative Young Generations for the New Balkans 2030. This is an initiative who sets the spotlight on youth and their progressive stances and hopes for the future. In addition, we have been organizing several events on the situation and the developments in Southeastern Europe. We have close contacts to partners in the region and we've been supporting democratic and progressive forces in the region for many years now. All this has to be seen in the context of close ties between Austria and the Western Balkans in history and nowadays. As you know, Austria is one of the strongest advocates of the EU accession of these countries. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, our events have to take place online but we very much hope that the discussion on Montenegro at the end of August may already take place at Press Club Concordia. We would uh, very much look forward if this is possible. I've already mentioned that this event is the result of a joint initiative and I would like to thank our partners, the IDM, the Institute for the Danube Region and Central Europe, especially uh, Sebastian Schäfer, the managing director, and also Ms. Silvia Nachivan. And uh, on the other side, uh, many thanks uh, to the Political Academy of the ÖVP, especially to Felix Ofner and Lorenz Jan. Many thanks to all for the good cooperation, as always. Since the beginning of this year, I've been providing a, a briefing on the situation in the respective country not only as an integral part of the event itself, but also in written form available before the elections and enriched by the results after the elections. This time, in the case of North Macedonia, I, miss, I myself have prepared this briefing 
and I would like to present it now. So, what's the situation in North Macedonia two days ahead of the parliamentary elections? What is important to know is that also in North Macedonia, these elections are snap elections. Snap, ele snap elections that had to be postponed. How come? On 3rd of January 2020, so at the beginning of this year, the then Prime Minister Zoran Saev resigned. Saev is the leader of the Social Democratic Union of Macedonia, SDSM is the abbreviation, and now since then, a caretaker government led by Oliver Spasovsky, also a social democrat, is leading the country. As required by law, the primary task of this transition government is to organize fair, democratic and credible parliamentary elections. These elections were to take place on 12th of April, so already three uh, months ago, but then the COVID-19 pandemic reached also North Macedonia and uh, these elections had to be postponed. This uh, came in a very bad moment, in an inopportune moment. The parliament was already dissolved and the caretaker government could not function as a real government. President Pendorovsky declared a 30-day state of emergency mid-March and prolonged it three times. And by doing so, the government was able to take over the legislative function and to issue decree laws. Another consequence of the pandemic was that the elections were postponed. I already mentioned that. And uh, what followed was also a, a heated debate when the elections could take place. And uh, yeah, about mid-June, a compromise was found that the elections were to, have, were to hold uh, on 15th of July. And also mid-June, on 12th of June to be exact, uh, President Pendarovsky lifted the state of emergency. What about the caretaker government? How is it uh, formed and what's the composition of it? As I said, it's uh, Oliver Sprasovsky, who is prime minister at the moment. He is also a social democrat. And uh, the caretaker government is large, largely reflects the previous government of Soran Saif. But there's an important difference. Uh, the main opposition party, the VMRO, DBMNE, uh, this abbreviation stands for Internal Macedonian Revolutionary Organization, Democratic Party for Macedonian National Unity. So this party, the main opposition party, nominated several ministers, deputy ministers, amongst the others the Minister for Internal Affairs. So this means the main parties, the Social Democrats, the Conservative Party, and also the, the main uh, Albanian party have to cooperate, at least to some extent. This is a huge challenge uh, for, for, for the main parties, at least, given that the political landscape in North Macedonia has been divided for many years. This division has been closely linked to longtime Prime Minister Gruevsky, who fled to Hungary. You, 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 you might remember this uh, story. He uh, led some controversial identity politics, and after some, after some scandals, wiretapping scandals and large-scale protests, Gruevsky had to resign in January 2016. Later in 2016, his party took, uh, took the first place in the elections. Uh, uh, let me share the results of the, of the 
of the 2016 elections. I hope you can see them now. So the VM, AO, DBM, and E uh, made the first place. The Social Democrats under Zoran Saev, with Zoran Saev as the leader, uh, was more or less the secret winner of the party with almost 37.9%. And Saif, after lengthy negotiations, was able to form a government, a coalition government with the Democratic Union for Integration and the Alliance for Albanians. And uh, this was after yeah, several months. This government was formed in May 2017. Let me come to the balance of Saif's term of office. What did he achieve? What was not achieved? When he came to power, he announced uh, to reform the country in a different way, with more democracy, more freedom, and more justice. He was quite successful in this. The European Commission, in its progress report, assessed the reforms positively, also did the Freedom House, but still, some critical issues remain, especially the country struggle with, struggle with corruption. The so-called racket extortion about one year ago in summer 2019 proved this, and this can also cast some shadows over Saif and his party. The North Macedonia economy performed quite well under Saif. GDP growth was was a was at around 3% or even higher. Unemployment went down, but remained on a, on a quite high level with about 16% in 2019. And still every year around 20,000 people leave the country, all, uh, above all young people. We have to bear in mind that hundreds of thousands of North Macedonians already live abroad. So yeah. Emigration it was and is still a huge issue, also for North Macedonia. One of the main objectives of Saif and his government was to unblock the beginning of EU accession talks. The major precondition for this was to solve the name dispute with Greece. And Saif was ready for a painful compromise. In June 2018, he and his Greek counterpart Alexis Tsipras signed the so-called Brespa agreement. This solved the name dispute and uh, the country was uh, had to be renamed from uh, Republic of Macedonia to Republic of North Macedonia. In return, Greece, had, Greece accepted to support North Macedonia's EU and NATO accession. We'll hear later about this. But in short, uh, in the country itself, uh, the, the treaty and the renaming of the country were heavily criticized. But in the end, uh, a two thirds majority in parliament approved the constitutional changes that were necessary. But uh, as you know, at least uh, at first sight, uh, all these efforts did not bring the desired success, uh, at least not immediately. In October 2019, the EU decided to delay the start of accession negotiations with North Macedonia and Albania. So the decision was blocked, especially by France. And uh, yeah. The hopes of Saif and his government and many North Macedonians were not fulfilled. This was a major blow for the government of Saif and the European ambitions of the country overall. And this was also the main reason for Saif's resignation at the beginning of this year. Only afterwards, in March, the Brespa agreement and the renaming of the country were approved. On 24th of March, uh, the EU Council gave finally green light to the beginning of EU accession talks. And three days later, North Macedonia became 
NATO member. So in March, two important events happened for North Macedonia. Let me turn now to the current election campaign. What dominates the, the, the election campaign? There's, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic and all its negative consequences. And there is still the deep cleavage between uh, the Social Democrats and the Burma, DPMNE party between the main parties. I've already mentioned that the country is facing a second spike of COVID-19 infections. Prohibitive measures and restrictions had to be reinstated. And this gives, of course, room for many political debates. Uh, the Conservative Party, although present in the caretaker government, is heavily criticizing the government and especially the Minister for Health Care. And COVID-19 also led to a worrying deterioration of the relationship between Orthodox Christians, mainly ethnic Macedonians, and Muslims, mainly ethnic Albanians. So, so between the la two largest religious groups in the country. Because Orthodox Christians feel a bit discriminated against, and also uh, due to the fact that uh, family gatherings during Ramadan provoked many new infections. Also, the economic outlook changed dramatically because of COVID-19. The government had to take uh, a wide range of measures in order to mitigate the negative effects. And these measures are quite similar to to measures taken in countries such as Austria. The renaming of the country still remains a contentious issue. The, the, the VMRO DPMNE party still rejects the agreement with Greece. And another element uh, of the electoral campaign during the last uh, weeks and months are the developments among the parties which represent ethnic Albanians. Let me remind you that the ethnic Albanians make, it, make up roughly a quarter of North Macedonia's population of uh, 2.1 million. And uh, this is also why Albanian parties often play a crucial role in the formation of coalitions. I already mentioned the Democratic Union for Integration under Ali Akhmeti. It has been junior party in various governments in 18 of the last 20 years. Uh, let us have a look at the, at the slide. Uh, with the, yeah, here you can see the, the parties and all the main candidates and their affiliation, the political ide ideology. So there are other Albanian parties who challenge the leading role of the Democratic Union. There's the Alliance for Albanians and the Alternative Party. They joined forces and uh, formed uh, an alliance. And what is more important, the Social Democrats formed also an alliance, an election alliance with the Beza movement, another ethnic Albanian faction. And this is the first time that there is a, an alliance between a Macedonian party and an ethnic Albanian faction. So having said this, what about polls and the outcome? of the parliamentary elections. There are not many reliable surveys, but there is one, I would say, published by the National Democratic Institute, a US democracy develop, development organization. And according to this poll, yes, thank you for the slide. Uh, according to this poll, as you can see, the the SDSM, so that the Social Democratic-led uh, movement, the Beza movement, alliance, 
is slightly ahead of the alliance led by VMRO, TPM, and E. It also shows, the server also shows that the electorate is uh, quite disappointed of politics. As you can see, many voters are still undecided. Many other people will not participate. So, yeah, we have to be quite curious what these elections will, will bring. Uh, as you might have noticed, the, the party colors a bit, are a bit misleading. Uh, in North Macedonia, the Social Democrats have dark blue as party colors, and the Conservatives uh, have red. So this was my, sh my, introdu my introduction, my briefing to the situation in North Macedonia. Having said this, I would like to return the floor to Sebastian, and I'm curious to listen to the inputs of our experts. Yeah, thank you so much um, for providing us with an overview. And I think we have now the perfect basis to um, discuss with our panel. But before I introduce them, I would uh, also welcome, of course, our guests who are watching and uh, draw your attention um, to the possibility to ask uh, questions via the chat uh, function in this room. Uh, make use of it. We're going to um, start a panel discussion. Um, in a second, and then uh, uh, type your questions and whatever you're interested in, um, and I will uh, pick them up um, as possible. So um, let's see. Can, can you hear us? Yes. Okay, we, we still don't have a picture. You can see us? No. Okay, something's happening now. Yeah. Okay. Okay, while we are doing this, maybe I take the um, opportunity to uh, introduce our um, already visible panel guests. And, um, I'm gonna run ID Okay, we're gonna mute this for a second and uh, start with um, our first uh, panel um, discussant, which is Sofia Maria Satanakis. Uh, she is uh, working at the AIES. Uh, in uh, Vienna. She's a research fellow there um, and the associate researcher at the European Council on Foreign Relations. Um, she um, works uh, especially on the topic of European integration, focuses uh, mainly on EU foreign security and defense policy, and concentrates on Greece and Turkey as well as other bilateral relations. So, uh, Sofia, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Can you hear me? Yes, that... perfect. Okay, perfect. perfect. <laughs> Hello. <Thank you. laughs> and we have with us uh, Stefani Spirovska, who is the president of the Youth Educational Forum in Skopje. Um, so a warm welcome uh, as well to our panel discussions. Thank you for being Hello, here. Hello, and thank you for having me here as well. And last but not least, we have with us Milan Mijalkovic, who um, hopefully has solved the microphone problems. Um, Mila Mijakovic is a uh, Austrian Macedonian architect, artist, and author. He teaches at the Technical University in Wien and also at the Johannes Kepler University in Linz. Thank you very much for being with us. Okay, we, we, can't hear you at the moment, but we see a very interesting picture. Um, I'm going to come uh, to this while you sort this out. Can you hear us now? Now, now we can hear you. So, okay, warm welcome on. once again. Thank you very much. Yeah, we're happy to be with you. Uh, we're a little bit surprised, to be honest, about uh, we thought this is an art project. Yeah. 
So uh, in this case, we are representing the potential of fine art that is contributing to the potential of democracy. What you see here is Milan Bialkovic, whose body is present, and all his mental uh, contributions to democracy. He is a visionary. So we're a little bit surprised with all the statistics that you gave us, you know. So uh, we are um, coming from a different viewpoint, and we are very happy to contribute the position of fine arts to this very fine discussion. We're happy that you're having us. We're uh, broadcasting live from a gallery in the center of Vienna, in the first district, which is right on the other side of the Museum of Applied Arts. So what you see here in this gallery, it is run by, uh, by Vladimir Matsura and David Matsura, his son, uh, very famous art collectors, where we're working together with. Uh, Milan Ryalkovich's body is present here and his uh, mental contributions to democracy can be seen on the walls. I will run you through the different works and the positions that this work is kind of put together from. Yeah, It's important that they know that you are the voice. I am the voice of Milan Ryalkovich for this discussion uh, unless he uh, decides to talk again. Yeah? So far, I will contribute my interpretation of his works. Thank you very yeah. much. Um, this is a surprise for us as well. I mean, uh, discussion you know, is, a, is, a, is a form of art, and yeah. uh, I'm very happy to have uh, something like this uh, with us. It's something that hasn't happened before in our um, coverage of the parliamentary elections, um, and uh, I think this can be a very interesting contribution to our discussion. I would like to uh, start with the first question, and my first question is for Sophia, we have heard about the Prespa Agreement. You are working on uh, the relationship uh, between uh, Greece and now North Macedonia. So uh, I would be uh, interested um, in your opinion about how um, this issue is still shaping the current um, parliamentary election campaign, um, because it was a very long process that led to an end. Um, that led to an outcome. Uh, what are your observations um, from from uh, these negotiations, and how will that influence the debates uh, of the um, of the parliamentary elections? Well, thank you very much for this question. Uh, I saw in the chat that my video is very dark. I cannot do anything about that. I'm sorry. It's the only spot, <laughs> quite convenient. But I hope you can hear me at least, right? Because some people, okay, perfect. So, uh, the Prespa Agreement, uh, it is a very odd topic, especially for someone who is an outsider and not directly involved. It's very hard for people to relate uh, to what those two populations uh, are going through or went through. But I will try to shed some light on this. I think that although the agreement was signed and ratified, uh, and it's been already uh, a couple of years now, uh, it will be an important topic now as well in the elections coming up, because we have to keep in mind that the people did not back them. Neither did the people of North Macedonia, nor did the people of Greece. Uh, they were strictly against it. We had protests uh, on the streets, anti-government slogans of betrayal on both sides. And as a result, obviously, neither of those two governments is currently in office. So it will be kind of a test, I think, of support for these pro-EU policies of uh, the government of uh, Zoran Zaev back in the day. Uh, and we will see if this will bear the fruit that people say, OK, we went through some hurdles, we gave up, we gave some concessions, we changed our name. Uh, we changed names of our airports, of our highways, and many, many other things. And then the EU said, no, it's not time to start accession negotiations yet. Then they changed their mind. And now we will see if all this back and forth uh, and this kind of painful road uh, will bear fruit in the end and have the support of the people to say, okay, we decided on that path. Let's continue with the hopes that eventually soon, sooner rather than later, we will be part of the EU and uh, the door will be more open than it was right after the agreement was signed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Um, I, I would be uh, interested, um, as uh, Sophia now said, um, she observed it as more of an outsider. Uh, I would like to ask Stefani, um, who is uh, on the spot, um, what, what, how do you observe the situation? Um, and especially uh, if we look at the last um, elections that now are all more or less grouped together in the region, um, for whatever reason, we can discuss this um, uh, also later on, um, that the youth did not as much participate um, because there was no relation to um, the, the offerings that the parties have made. How is the situation um, concerning the um, discussion about the name of the country, um, and especially with regards to the youth uh, in the region? So yeah, thank you. Um, when we talk about young people and elections in general, uh, we always come to the same conclusion that we lack uh, political participation among young people because we lack um, democratic culture and we lack the, that political culture, culture among young people. And that's not something that occurs only during elections, but it's something that is part of young people's lives starting from their school, then on their municipality level, then on national level, and then when it comes to elections, most of the time they, they feel excluded. Um, and recently we had a research that, that showed this, saying that um, young people do not believe that the institutions care about their needs, that the, that the institutions or the political system in general takes into consideration where do they stand and, and how should they create the policies in accordance to uh, their their position and their standing. So that would be the answer uh, from me why uh, why young people are rather uh, being apathetic when it comes to uh, comes to making this sort of decisions. And uh, if we um, look back when we had the debate about the change of the name and then we had the debate about I mean when the referendum was taking place, then the debate was mainly uh, in the field of should we give up on something in order to, to gain something that we have been expecting for a long time. Because um, when you take a look into what do young people expect here, they certainly expect to become part of the European Union. And then again, if you ask them uh, in what time will we become part of the European Union, then they have really unrealistic expectations, mm -hmm. which again, uh, points the, the light or makes it even more clear that there are some, um, I would say, holes but missings in the in the educational system and in, in, in how we raise our next generations and their activity and participation in, uh, in general in processes. Um, also, it was interesting, recently the, the Westminster Foundation for Democracy in, uh, in North Macedonia and Skopje did a, a research on, actually they analyzed the, the list of the candidates in this uh, election. And uh, the average age in all the lists was 42 years old, which shows us again, how much the young people are actually included in this sort of like um, crucial processes and putting them on uh, very, very important, uh, very important positions, or at least giving them space to create policies. Because one thing we know for sure that during the creation of the programs of the parties, young people haven't really been consulted a lot. So um, in general, there is lack both of inclusion, of trust uh, among young people, and that results in apathy, I would say, uh, from the young people. I, I think I answered the question. Yes, you did. Thank you very much. Um, so now I would like to ask the voice of uh, Milan Mijalkovic um, with relations and challenges that are arising um, from this uh, discussion about about the um, about the name of the country and the changes with this um, what would be an artistic approach towards the challenges that have been um, arisen from this We don't, at least I don't hear anything at the moment. Your microphone is muted. Okay, 
as you yeah. saw, the confetti is showing us. Yeah. As you see, the confetti is showing us that we see the. Ah, you must do it again. Ah, you must do it again. Okay. Uh, yes. Now you can hear us. We see democracy as a big celebration, and Macedonia is a pilot project of the art project of potentially uh, imagining what democracy could be like for us. So art is introducing the unforeseeable into the play of otherwise we would always introduce the same and the same and reproduce the past. We don't want to reproduce the past because democracy is as old as humanity. The Democrat has the big mouth and the big black mouth which is showing the unknown. He is representing all the unknown because a democratic speaker will always try to find out the truth and not represent what he already knows and try to persuade people. Those are Democrats, which we call false Democrats. So Mila Mialkovic's work is taking a lot of care on reflecting how these different elements of honesty can be uh, actually and, lie. and lies can be found and also improved and prosecuted. What you see in the back here is Mila Mialkovic taking over responsibility for all catastrophes that ever happened in nature. No, you, never. 2000 years. 2000 years is enough and you can buy a share of it. You can buy responsibility, so which is very important. We need to take responsibility for all the actions that happen around us in our very present reality. And then you can start doing art. And then you can start doing art and then you can start behaving as a true democracy. Mm -hmm. Because if you look in the back of this year, you will see a work which is posing and showing that it's very important to have an inclusion of everything. So the animate, the inanimate, and all is included in our understanding of humanity. It's also showing that they are mixing, mixing everything. It is also showing that everything is mixed up at the end of the day. We have a sophistical way of speaking. We have a sophistical way of speaking. And if you look at humanity itself, you see a human being here, an overseeing person. These feet are 30,000 years old, and this face is the expression of today's knowledge of culture and the refinement that democracy can show. So, the she, whole, was, she was speaking about the youngsters. So, the whole setup is that we want to introduce that as a minority, as a majority of the Democrats. So, we think that we also want. The black people to vote, yeah? And we want to give everybody a voice. If you speak about the young people nowadays, you know, Yankovic did a research on the internet and he found a young Macedonian kid, five years old. not older than five years, sniffing glue. glue. I mean, when this is telling the story, these he's people, probably dead. he's probably dead, and these people should should govern the country because these people are the minority which can become a voice of Macedonia. So Macedonia as a democratic art project is supposed to involve everyone. This is our position. The forest, the whole place should govern. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Right um, show the picture of the kid once again. I show it again. And then the picture of the Democrat. Let me show you the picture again. I'm going to... These are the kids we're talking about. And this is the yeah. Democrat addressing the unknown. I think we, I think we understood. Um, the good thing is we're recording as well. So uh, we will have to have a possibility to go back uh, to the pictures that you have shown. Uh, yeah, let's do that. Oh, we have any questions? Just, um, I would like to ask, um, I would like to show a question um, that has been uh, posed um, because the um, question was, was raised, um, if there are any percentage posts, how many of uh, the um, North Macedonian population are against the PRESPA? Um, agreement. And I would like to ask um, anyone who uh, might be um, in position of such data to respond. 
Um, may I briefly cut in? Yeah. Um, well, the only polls that I have in my possession are from the beginning of this year, before the outbreak uh, of COVID-19. And it's, again, uh, Gerhard mentioned it before, the National Democratic Institute. Mm -hmm. uh, and it says that things are rather balanced when it comes to supporting or not supporting the agreement. It was, I think, 31% against and 30% uh, are for it or vice versa. So uh, it's not very much in favor. So like three in 10 people, uh, I think, are supporting it. Uh, I see. So that's, the, that's the only poll I have in my possession, yes. OK. And um, Stefani, do you have any more insights towards that? I don't really have any particular numbers uh, regarding the perception of how many people are for or against, but I can say that the uh, turnout in the elections, actually on the referendum, when this, uh, when the change of the name was part of the question, it was pretty low. So I would say that people were at least uncertain regarding that. Um, so I don't have anything exact to add, but I can just give that perspective that people were either um, staying away from making the decision or were, were really uncertain on what they, they want or do not want. All right. Um, let's maybe um, focus a bit on um, a different topic that is important um, in the election. And uh, one of the main um, challenges that uh, will be out there that we will not see a majority for any of the two big parties. So that will mean uh, that they will have to be in a coalition. And uh, my question for uh, Stefani would be, um, there are uh, discussions going on that one of the, the possibilities could be, um, and Gerhard mentioned that the minority, Albanian minority parties always played um, a, an important role during uh, the last uh, years in um, the politics of uh, North Macedonia. Um, so there are discussions going on that maybe a, a possibility um, to get out of, uh, to, 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 to get the majority uh, would be that the North Macedonian, um, the next North Macedonian prime minister could come from the Albanian uh, minority. Do you think that um, that this is uh, something that will shape uh, the election? Is this something that is discussed? Um, and, and what do you think is going to happen um, um, in the next uh, three days? We actually started election already uh, due to the COVID measures um, today. And the, 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 the real election day for the general public will be on Wednesday. Eh? Yeah, that's true. So the election, uh, the election days, uh, this, uh, this time or this election, there are three election days in comparison to every other elections when there are only two days for, uh, for a casting a vote. So basically in the first day, uh, the people in hospitals and the prisoners vote and on the second day, everyone else. But now we have one extra day, which is, uh, which which was added uh, because there are many people in self isolation or and there are also more people in the in the hospitals. Um, so um, regarding the question about who is going to win or what the results would look like, there are several uh, several opinion surveys uh, available in in the uh, in the public, and I recently came across an an, an, an analysis which was uh, that depending on who is standing behind the survey, there is a different result. And the discussion was mainly about if the media is giving the right information, because uh, in case they're, they're shaping the information, then, then they should like uh, be res held responsible for that. But however, uh, the results are, or the opinion surveys, are either 4% for the, the current government, so or 2.5% um, for the opposition. So depending on who's behind that, those are the results. In both cases, in both scenarios, the results are pretty close. So we can take that for, for sure. Um, and when we're talking about the coalitions and about who's going to form a government with whom, um, there is one interesting thing since 2001 um, till now, and it's called the, the frame agreement. So the, the Ohrid frame agreement was basically uh, designed to solve the systematic 
discrimination, I would say, or the possibility to left one ethnic group out of the uh, coalition forming and government forming and so on. So basically, each and every time we have, since 2001 till today, we have coalition which is formed or government which is formed uh, between Macedonians and Albanians in the governing, uh, in the governing majority. So um, I couldn't say for sure who's going to make the coalition with whom, but we're definitely going to have that respecting the framework um, agreement for sure. Uh, another thing that people expect now is quick forming of the government because we need functional institutions and we need like to overcome this uh, pre-electoral period, which makes kind of everything uh, more slow and um, I suppose that the government will be will be formed kind of uh, following all the procedures and not having additional things to to wait for until it starts working. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can uh, follow up with the questions that have been raised by the audience. Um, so as I understand um, one of the um, so you would say that there is um, a possibility that uh, one of the minority government uh, minority parties would um, also um, be into a uh, go into a coalition with uh, renewal or the, the the party block that is formed by Vimero. Um, once we have the results on the election day, I think things would start to open and become more clear then. But uh, for now, I think there is a possibility for that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, when we talk about numbers, do you have also um, numbers on uh, the expected outcome for this um, election? And then even more specifically between um, um, the uh, North Macedonians and the Albanian minority? Uh, well, it depends. But what we know for sure is that people are more skeptic due to the COVID crisis. So uh, we need to take that into consideration, and, and that could definitely influence the turnout on this uh, on these elections. And in comparison to the situations in the region, like if we take, for an example, Serbia, uh, and the numbers of the COVID cases before the elections, there was a significant drop of the numbers. And uh, I would say that here, like let's let's take for instance the previous week, which was one week before the elections we had one of the greatest numbers uh, of COVID cases, which leads me to the point that we have the, the real data at all uh, time point given, and that could definitely influence the people who are um, considered and uh, afraid for their health, and that could also influence their decision if they would go out and vote on the election day or not. So um, if... Um, the last data we have for turnout was from the referendum when people were deciding a very specific question. This time, I think that the COVID would play a significant role regarding how comfortable would people feel to go out and, and cast their vote. Thank you. Sophia, um, the, the challenge um, for, for uh, the Zayev um, government, or the, now we would have to say the previous government, as we have the caretaker government at the moment in place, um, was that they have um, tied their their uh, political success to um, the negotiation uh, process of becoming a EU member. Um, now we have the situation that um, these snap elections would have fallen into a time period where it was not yet uh, clear if they uh, the the blocking from especially the the, the French president Macron um, would prevent this. Um, then uh, the COVID pandemic broke out um, and we have now the situation that um, the um, uh, blocking from the side of the European Union to not open uh, negotiations yet has been lifted. Um, but at the same time, we also see already um, the, the uh, economic results and also, um, I don't know if this... this uh, would be um, a security question um, as well, but nevertheless, um, uh, influences from the pandemic on the economy and also on, on the um, public health security um, in the country. Uh, what would your be? Uh, what would your assessment be 
um, concerning the potential outcome of the election. Did the postponement due to the COVID pandemic help um, the uh, Zayev and his party uh, to probably win this election or um, doesn't it matter at all and other things will be determining the outcome? Well, that's hard to say. I think uh, it's difficult to answer with certainty uh, when it comes to that question. But I would say it's going to be difficult anyway. Even if the elections were held like two or three months before, uh, it still would have been uh, difficult to win, especially with like a huge uh, distance from the others. Um, the European Union did, in my opinion, did not handle the, the situation uh, as good as it could have been, and it might have caused more more trouble than than help in the long run. Uh, by this whole reforming the accession process and no, you're not ready yet, although we pressured you to change your name, to sign the PRESPA agreement, and so on and so forth. So it remains to be seen. I mean, two more days and then we will know if it was the good timing or not. But, um, I mean, it, the situation that the country finds itself in is a very particular one, a very specific one, because you have now to deal with the pandemic being a small country, being a relatively poor country, being dependent on the EU also for financial assistance, for aid uh, to be able to cope with the whole situation. And then you have also to deal with uh, a new framework or a changed framework for accession negotiations, uh, which would be complicated and difficult anyway, without having to think about recovering uh, from uh, a global pandemic, recovering from the economy, uh, and the backlash is there. So it's a very difficult situation for the country, I would say. Um, and I don't think a few months before or after would have made that much of a difference. Maybe now that we're a bit closer to saying, yeah, it looks pretty good now to open the negotiations for real, maybe this would be like a kind of a small turning point to say, okay, there is a fair chance that uh, the Social Democrats will will take the lead by some percentage points. But uh, I cannot be uh, certain of this. Thank you very much. So I've, I've seen uh, quite some activity um, in the background and um, I would like to um, ask the voice of Milan Mijakovic. Um, you have to unmute if, if you want to also chip into the discussion um, and maybe you can read out what you just showed into the camera for our plenary. Art is strong and art is still. We would like to ask you, uh, because you're talking a lot about things you already know, it's, uh, it's the, the part that is actually a little bit boring for us and I think also the future of democracy, because democracy is living, living a lot of potential. So now if we take Macedonia as an art project to improve all of democracy for humanity, we should talk about the things that you don't know yet. And we would like to talk about the things where you see the biggest potential to improve the democratic consciousness of the conscious mind of, of the people, which are already very much involved, but they don't have a voice yet. So how can we give everyone a voice? We are living in a We're living in a sophisticated time. The sophists are governing again. And the sophists are governing again. Not the philosophers. Not the philosophers. Because the sophists are not interested in the truth. Because the sophists, they are not interested in the truth. But they are interested only. But they are interested only. In. In. In persuasion. Persuasion of what they already know. So this is something that is blocking the democratic process. Yeah. So we see it today and now. That this is not bringing anything forward. Yeah. So how can we improve in the truth seeking seeking of the democratic process? Everybody is repeating what we already know. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's a good point um, that we are. Um, also should talk about um, further challenges um, for the democratic development of the country. Um, although we are not 
necessarily talking about what we already know because we don't know the electoral outcome uh, yet. So in that sense, um, we, of course, tackle questions that are being there, but nevertheless, uh, with, an, with a certain uncertainty. Um, but I would like to use the remark that has been made by the voice of uh, Mila Mijakovic um, that uh, there, there is, um, there is uh, a great um, debate in uh, all of our uh, democratic systems um, that there is a, there is a challenge uh, for this information and also for um, threatening the um, political system with um, various influences. And um, I would be very much interested in how much um, this is actually an issue um, in the North Macedonian uh, parliamentary elections. Uh, Stefani, can you maybe uh, tell us a little bit more about um, how this information is, is also um, shaping the, the current electoral campaign and how um, much this is also something that comes from an external um, influence, or is it rather something that is that is happening within the country? It's an interesting phenomenon on how, uh, whenever something very, um, I don't know, str strange or threatening is happening, we have a tendency to say that someone from abroad is doing that to us. So that's something that we always blame to outside of the country. But when we talk about misinformation, that's definitely a problem we have been facing for uh, for several years. I mean, and it's directly related to the development of social media. So uh, from the very moment that people have started informing themselves from social media, there is, a, I would say, a significant uh, rise of, uh, of fake news because the, there is, I would say less opportunity of uh, fake news within the traditional media, such as newspaper or the, the TV news. Um, there is a significant amount of uh, disinformation, especially at this pre-electoral um, time. And uh, it's mainly related to the wi either wiretaped materials, um, either uh, related to the to the party programs and so on and so forth. And I would say that that is because we lack two things. One is responsibility among the, the media and among the uh, journalists that stand behind the news that are let uh, publicly. And the other thing um, is that we lack media literacy. So all of the research and the analysis show that um, young people lack these skills, particularly particularly for two things, not only to inform themselves, but also to protect themselves. And this is an interesting topic, and it's a bit a bit more distant than what we are talking about today. But if we take, for example, the, the online uh, education and everything that's now being, being transferred online, we still miss this crucial part, such as um, protection online and also being more media literate and so on and so forth. And I would say that this information is a serious threat and we have mainly non-government organizations that work a lot in this field, not only uh, to raise awareness about the existence of, of uh, misinformation and disinformation, but also to do a little bit of fact checking in order to really alarm or ring the alarm if something fake is uh, circulating and it's affecting uh, people's opinion. So yes, the spirit has been very fragile in that regard, I would say. Mm -hmm. Sophia, how would you evaluate um, external factors contributing to um, the threat of democracy or even supporting uh, democracy when we when we look at um, um, the situation that is that is present uh, in the country? When you say external factors, do you mean external actors or what exactly do you mean? I, I would say um, I would sum up with this, of course, on the one hand side, the uh, support that is coming um, the, from, from uh, the European Union and the uh, possibility to um, have this integration. Um, and on the other hand side, of course, external actors that might contribute to uh, this information, even if um, the voice of Milan Mijakovic says fake news um, are not existing, but it's rather a lack of understanding. Maybe we can 
take that into consideration. What do you say about um, the claim here? If if people would understand better um, how how uh, this information works, then there would be no fake news. I think fake news would be there even if people would understand better. But in order to have people understand the fake news better or to to spot them easier. Uh, someone has to to give them the necessary tools and education, as uh, Stefani rightly mentioned, and raise awareness. And that's a progress that takes time. So maybe uh, Milan himself could could elaborate a bit more on how we could raise this the understanding of of, of fake news. Um, I can only speak from the European Union perspective, from mm -hmm. the European perspective. Uh, which definitely is the fact that we need to keep the Western Balkans close and not just North Macedonia, but in general, the whole area. We need to keep them close to, to Europe and eventually also uh, integrate them into the club, if I may use this, this word, which I don't really like. But uh, yes, so that would be one way to, to also counter this strategic, political, economic vacuum that might... Uh, establish in case the relationship between those two, the EU and the Western Balkans slash North Macedonia is is damaged because we have actors in the back who are interested in the region, who are meddling in the region, who are engaged. We have China with the Belt and Road Initiative and uh, the economic assistance, which is rather limited to the economic factor, at least for now, and not just uh, spreading to, to uh, political uh, engagement and other things. We have Russia. We always have had Russia, who is not uh, very pleased with the fact that uh, a lot of countries have joined NATO now from the area, and the EU is getting closer and closer to those countries now. So um, there are definitely factors here and there that the EU needs to consider, because if we don't move uh, with like determination now and don't have a clear path like this is what we're going to do and this is the timeline that we want to do it in uh, then we will for sure face some some alienation and other other uh, actors engaging more and taking over mm -hmm. um, when when we talk about the european union um, i would uh, add one of the the questions that have been uh, raised by our audience um, and then get back to the claim about the fake news. So when Macron um, said no, the EU tried to send a more positive message to North Macedonia. Um, and how was that uh, perceived? Was it noted ignored or did these promises, despite all, play a role uh, in the um, campaign? Um, maybe Stefani can uh, pick up that question. Yeah, so I would say that it was a source of uh, disappointment because people felt like they um, gave up a lot of things or something that's very significant for them and that they received an answer they weren't expecting, especially in a period where like the, the imaginary checklist of the of the country on its way towards the European Union was uh, being very tidy and everything was checked. Um, so... But what is more interesting is that when we received the positive answer recently for opening the negotiation process, the negotiating process, sorry, um, it didn't really get as much attention as it could because the COVID crisis were very strong at that time and people were more focused on their health rather than on the EU integration. But if I have to answer or if I should answer, um, how was the French no perceived? I would say that it was a real source of um, of a disappointment because people were expecting yes at that particular time. But it it's good that after a short period we uh, we we received a positive answer. So now things are starting to move into the right direction, or that's how people feel. Um, and unfortunately, we didn't have enough time to to do a research on how young people feel at that particular time point, and and if that was going to make them more. Uh, more active or more apathic in the entire political process. But I think that the, the, the work we're going to do in the upcoming months will uh, show us where do they stand now so we can make a correlation with the current yes or opening or green light, let's say, uh, and, the, and the data we have from before the uh, decision when we received the no. 
Mm -hmm. Would would you say that there is um, this distinction uh, clear between that it's not the European Union that is blocking this, but it's part of its member states who are doing this, or is it hard to make uh, that distinction uh, by the general general public? At the end of the day, I think that people perceive France as a very important part of the European Union. So I would say that it's kind of one same thing. But what I would say is a positive. Uh, thing here is that the disappointment did not result into um, making people more like being whatever if we uh, become part of the European Union or not. So it did not change the perception of the value of the European Union and, and the security and everything that it brings with itself. But it was rather a disappointment of are we going to wait as much as we have been waiting so far. So in, in that regard, uh, that's the answer, but when uh, when we have to make a distinguishment between the, the France and the European Union, I would say that it's more or less the, the same thing because the French decision is a big and significant part of the European Union's decision. COVID is an opportunity to include the unknown. I we'll, agree. We'll, pick, we'll pick that up in a second, but first I, I would also uh, like to ask... Um, uh, Sophia, uh, that that question in that sense is it is it a challenge from uh, the perspective of the European Union that uh, single member states influence um, the fate of of other um, potential and candidate uh, countries and especially when we think about the situation that North Macedonia has been uh, affected by this. Um, First, by uh, uh, Greece blocking uh, accession nego negotiations and also accession to NATO. Um, and now uh, France, um, um, at least temporarily, influencing uh, that process. Is, is that a challenge um, for, for the uh, European Union foreign policy, since there is still um, this unanimity, unanimity uh, necessary when it comes to those big decisions? It is definitely a challenge, definitely. Uh, and it also shows that um, there are some elements that you cannot quite predict because for a long time it was just blamed on Greece because they used their veto. They said, no, we don't want them in NATO. We don't want them in the European Union for many, many, many years. As we all know, it went on for decades. Uh, so once the Greeks could no longer exercise that veto because they had reached some kind of, 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 of compromise, we see that still there might be other actors, other member states who come up and say, yeah, well, no, because this and that. And it was not just France. It was France who was in the forefront, obviously, and, and everyone concentrated on France, but also the Netherlands were not very, very happy uh, about the whole situation with the accession process. And um, I think Denmark as well. So we have islands of member states here and there who might come up and say, no, we're strictly against it. And that's definitely a challenge because it affects the whole of the European Union. And as Stefani said, there is a difficulty. It's difficult to distinguish between like the EU and Brussels and then, yeah, France. You cannot just blame it on France. France is one of the now two big players of the European Union with the United Kingdom gone. Uh, you just have France and Germany. And if one of the big ones, of the two big ones says, uh, no, because we have some objections, then obviously that will influence uh, the whole of the EU's foreign policy and foreign action. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it's a good thing that it did not influence the, the willingness of the country to, to join the EU eventually. Mm -hmm. And if I also may add one small remark, it's not that once you say we start negotiation um, on the accession that after like a month, a year, you can enter the European Union. It is a process that can take years and years. But after like these hurdles and name changes and things that can be painful for a country to to make, it would have been a nice like um, factor of credibility. Mm -hmm. I think that's the word uh, that would sum it up, that the European Union also seems like a credible actor to trust. Like if we deliver, then you deliver as well. Mm -hmm. And it's. I mean, we have we have seen that to a to a certain 
uh, extend also with the discussion between the two big players, Germany and France, when it came to the accession and the start of the negotiations uh, back in, in, in uh, 2005 with, with Turkey, when Sarkozy and Merkel said, well, we um, want to um, uh, ask the people eh, um, after uh, the whole process went through, um, which is not something that is primarily directed towards the candidate country, but it's rather directed towards the internal audience of those countries. And there's a, there's a real danger that um, on the expense of, of foreign policy, internal policies of the EU member states are made. Huh? Yeah, I mean, Turkey is a, is an example. I, I would not like to compare North Macedonia with uh, the things that are going on with, in Turkey. But the one thing that you you can like um, compare is the fact that uh, you cannot always expect a country to knock on the door without giving them something, without saying, yeah, okay, now it's time, now we move one step ahead. You don't necessarily have to move 10 steps ahead, but like one step at a time, you need to also show them that you're being serious. It's not just a rhetoric. Like we want to include the Western Balkans, we have the Western Balkan summits, like we did two years ago in Sofia, but then nothing tangible happens. That's something you cannot do for years and years without expecting consequences, like we said before, with other actors uh, taking over in these areas. Right. Okay, we have um, the um, comment that was raised by uh, Franz Lothar Altmann that we should uh, come back um, to the um, this upcoming elections. Um, it's feeling that we are going a bit astray, although I think that this is also an important part uh, with relation to um, the future after the elections. But nevertheless, um, he wants to know about economics, environment, education, foreign politics, and dealing with the COVID-19. Um, and I would like to ask um, Stefani, what are, um, apart from the things that we have uh, discussed, internal um, aspects of that election, and also maybe um, here to include uh, what has also been posed, um, is that uh, do the uh, minority parties, the Albanian minority parties, differentiate um, in certain aspects here, so that you clearly can see differences um, when it comes to these, these uh, policies. Okay, so um, if we need to uh, name what should the, the priorities be after, mm. the, the crisis, or after the crisis and after the elections, actually, the crisis is still going to be here. I would say that definitely um, economics and education and also the environment are um, burning issues that are still going to remain here around us especially education, because that's the field where I work in. So my organization is pretty much focused on youth policies and education. And we see that there are uh, many things like decreasing uh, the level of, of quality they should be having. Um, when we talk about differenti differentiation, the um, Albanian uh, parties, um, of course, there are some uh, differences. But um, if you look a bit closely, it's kind of hard to see uh, who's offering what because the the culture of debating before uh, the elections is still not well developed, I would say. And since recently we see several of the representatives or several parties have their representatives present in the, in the public uh, debates almost always, but there is lack of uh, public debate in order to see who's offering who, especially at times when uh, the, the political programs or the programs of, for, for these elections are not really um, available or available in, the, in both languages, so in Macedonian and Albanian. Um, okay, but how do the main parties differentiate on these issues? Um, may I ask on which issues, if you could type? I think the issues that you have been uh, mentioned, mentioned, environmental protection, um, um, education, etc. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I think that's... Uh, I think that's a yes. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay. Um, there are not many well-developed plans on, um, on the protection of the environment 
and that that's a problem we're always facing during winter so now it's a bit uh so it's not not that important at this particular moment before the elections but every winter we have the same problem with the air pollution and uh everything that it brings with itself so we didn't really get clear offers on who's going to do what on that uh on that field um then when we talk about education uh, they're all saying that they're going to bring uh more quality education but how are we going to do that we don't really see a clear vision on it. So uh, I would say that more or less the parties are uh, like highlighting the burning issues, al al although I can speak only about the programs that are publicly available and available in both languages and that have been already discussed, but uh, they're, they're not really uh, clear, clear plans for all of the things I've mentioned so far. Raising the minimum wage is also um, something that uh, has been discussed. Huh? Yeah, that was something that was discussed and mainly between uh, SDSM and uh, Vomero. And there was uh, a very curious thing that after you do the calculations, the raise of the minimum wage that uh, Vomero was offering was actually lower than the current minimum wage. So that was... Um, I think a very curious thing, because if you are uh, the average person who is going to vote and who would not really sit down and calculate everything on paper and be well informed, then you could make a badly informed uh, decision. So that was one of the curious things that were part of the this times. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, unfortunately, we will um, soon have to come to an end um, of our uh, discussion. And so I would uh, use this opportunity for one um, last round. Um, and I would uh, like to give the floor again to the voice of uh, Milan Mijakovic. Um, how, do you, how do you see, apart from the things that you have raised right now, um, that we are in the unknown and that we need to talk about things that we haven't uh, raised yet, um, and that we all should go out to vote if I interpret it your visual input that you have given over the, the past couple of minutes correctly. What else um, can we expect uh, from an artistic point of view um, after this election? And you have to unmute your microphone, unfortunately. Thank you very much. May we ask to get the last word, please? But we would like to take over the discussion. Andreas, yes. I would like to know who are the, who are the speaking with. Are they communists, Democrats, or Anna his word? Can you start with me? Please, can you ask? Yeah. That? So, uh, the voice of Milan Biak, which Why is are they not giving now, us to speak? Uh, we would like to know who you are. Are you Democrats? Are you Christians? Are you <clears throat> anarchists? Or communists? Or communists? How would you describe yourself, every single one? So we can understand this kind of talk, because for us it's really strange. So we would like to understand this kind of talk, because for us, from the point of view of art, it's very strange to only talk about what happened already, and to, pro to make to repeat the yourself. to repeat yourself so here, by the other instead of talking about opportunities. You know? COVID-19 was a huge opportunity to involve everybody, because everybody Please, was I would like scared to know and wanted to get involved. So I would like to know who you are, okay? Are you communist? Are you anarchist? Are you, yeah. are you I, Democrat? Are you Christian? First, first the... the, the <laughs> Okay, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, meet you again here, and then uh, I would, I would tell you that uh, I wouldn't want to describe myself uh, with one of the labels that you presented, but if I would have to choose one of them, I would definitely be a Democrat. Um, my final question, and I will give you the floor maybe one more time, um, but the last word will always be with the moderator um, in a second. Um, but let me ask you, uh, Stefani, very briefly, please, what do you expect um, um, after the election? What will, what will be uh, the future of North Macedonia? That's kind of a um, hard question. But um, if I have to say what should the first thing that we will work on be, I would say that combating the, the COVID crisis, definitely. And uh, now we have more relaxed measures. I expect for the measures to be at least 
um, kind of more, uh, more more intense. I would say that, uh, and definitely focusing on the on the things that uh, have suffered mostly in the recent period. So that could be about unemployment, quality of education. Uh, then further on, it would be the environment protection and so on and so forth. But most of all, I would expect uh, functional institutions that are going to be committed to their particular role in the society because that's, I would say, what we lack most, especially at times like this when almost um, more than more than five months, I would say, we have dissolved uh, parliament. So we definitely need a um, strong parliament who is going to cooperate from within and is going to 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 bring uh to to vote on on good laws and um enabling us to 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 function as a society i would say definitely thank you very much um sophia the outcome and the future of the elections um what do you think from a um from a uh, eu perspective what what will uh, this election mean for the further european integration well, very, very briefly, to sum it up in one sentence, I would say uh, that these elections will show uh, if there will be a continuation of uh, the reform process that has been initiated uh, in the last elections of December 2016, uh, when the Social Democrats um, took power, so to say, and we'll see if this process of democratic reform and the road towards the EU will continue uh, after the 15th of July, or if we'll have some kind of, of uh, stagnation, maybe. I hope Thank not. you very much. <laughs> and now um, the voice of Milan Mijajkovic, unmute your microphone for one last uh, very brief uh, comment. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, in the end, we would just like to point out that the democratic debate as it is supposed to be, is by hearing the inner voice, will start after this conversation is over, where everybody can hear himself more clearly, and we hope that we have a conclusion to give you some thoughts that are not included in our package. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, it has been a pleasure um, to have this very interesting uh, panel together with us. Um, the last couple of months have brought a lot of new things for the challenges and opportunities that we um, as the Institute for the Danube region and Central Europe uh, have experienced. Um, we have had many first experiences and, and many new experiences. Um, and so I'm very glad that I still can be uh, surprised because if you think uh, that, that this was, a, was something that was planned, <laughs> I can tell you, um, I was as much uh, as uh, surprised as probably everyone else. Um, but anyway, um, it's it's uh, it's something that we that we definitely will continue in the future and maybe also see some some other uh, surprises. But let's now um, simply wait what the what the outcome of the elections will be. Um, thank you very much to all our panelists. Thank you, Stefani. Uh, good luck. Uh, stay healthy um, also during the, the difficult voting process. Sophia, thank you very much uh, for joining us and uh, enlightening us and uh, uh, sharing your insights uh, from your work. Um, I'm looking forward uh, to continue this discussion in different formats. And also, of course, thank you very much to Milan Mijakovic um, and his artistic performance that brought a different aspect um, to, to our panel discussion. Um, stay healthy, follow our activities, and as Gerhard mentioned in the very beginning, we are going to continue this format and look forward um, to analyze the uh, elections in Montenegro somewhere in August. Take care and bye-bye.